Hello and welcome to this week's episode of The Insider, brought to you just for a change by Vanishing Inc. My guest today is one of Magic's real living legends. He has a well-earned, amazing reputation in Magic. He's an author, a creator, a performer, a consultant, a pioneer in ebook publishing, being amongst the first to realise how well using video and text together made such a wonderful learning experience. And today, well, he's extremely busy working on Fool Us. It's Michael Close. Michael, how are you today? I'm well, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Well, thank you for doing it. Um, what's your origin story? You have 24 seconds. Uh, my home planet, uh, Krypton, was exploding. <laughs> And my father put me in a rocket and sent me to uh, Cleveland, Ohio, where I was raised by uh, Sam and Marietta Close. And uh, my dad was in industry. Uh, we moved around quite a bit. Uh, ended up in Fort Wayne, Indiana, which is in the northwest, uh, northeast corner of the state of Indiana. Uh, there was a magic shop there uh, owned by Dick Stoner, who is still around and an old friend. Bought my first tricks there probably when I was six years old, and the bug bit, and uh, never really let go. I've, uh, uh, yeah, so it's about 62 years now I've been interested in magic. Do you remember what the uh, what the first tricks you bought from Dick? Oh, I absolutely do. Uh, there, there were a couple things. There was a magic set called the Sneaky Pete magic set, which I may have gotten for my fifth birthday. I actually saw Dick Stoner perform at my school, I think when I was five. I still remember some of the tricks he did. He did hippity hop rabbits. He oh. did the ghost tube. Um, so there were the tricks in that sneaky Pete set. And um, one of the things that was in there was the, uh, what was it? The the trick of Horace, the old uh, old trick where you sever the head of the horse. Mm -hmm. with, uh, and uh, that was a, a little plastic version of that. And then at Stoner's Magic Shop, I got the uh, Penny to Dime with the little plastic block with the magnet inside that lifts off a shell coin. And two little plastic, um, I don't know what you even call them, columns that were attached at the bottom and a string went through and then you could slice through it and show that it was cut and then pull it back through again. Those were the first tricks that I owned. Well, well, and, of course, and of course, Aired Nace because I want to seem like I was cool. Well, yeah, of course, man. That's standard, right, for a five-year-old. Of course, exactly right. Yeah. Now, no, those were, the, those were the tricks. I'm, I'm going to use this podcast for a bit of uh, personal consultation, um, but I'm sure there are many listeners that are in the same boat. I'm 49, I've been doing card magic since I was 11, and I still haven't learned the stack, and, and I want to. Now, you're very well known for your mem deck work, so help me out. Two questions. One, how should I choose which stack to learn? And two... What do you think, in your experience, are the best strategies you found that work best to actually memorize them? Well, okay, and we have a half an hour. Um, <laughs> I actually have done um, about a, it's either 45 minutes or an hour long uh, targeted training video that's on my website on this very subject. It's called Demystifying ah. Memorized Deck. But I'll, I'll give you I'll give you a very uh, I'll give you a very short version which is uh, your first step has to be uh, to ask the question, how am I going to use this thing? Most people mm -hmm. memorize a stack simply because everybody is memorizing a stack now. When I got interested in actually learning it, which was back in 1990, uh, I had known of Simon Aronson's stack for quite a few years because he published it in the late 70s, I think. Um, and I knew exactly how I wanted to use the stack. I wanted to use it as an improvisational device to be able to um, sort of make up effects as I go along. I was influenced by that by um, Bert Allerton, who had a trick in his book uh, that used that. And, of course, uh, experiencing Juan do his uh, mnemonicosis uh, improvised uh, handling. So I specifically knew how I wanted to use the stack. And at the time, the only stacks right. available really were um, one stack had not been published in English yet. Uh, I had Simon stack. There was Nicola. There was the Ireland stack. And I was good friends with Simon by this point in time. And uh, I, uh, so I learned that one. Now, I learned it using the method <clears throat> he suggested, which is a mnemonic method. Um, Juan, of course, and uh, people like Woody Aragon suggest every other way except 
mnemonics. And this is uh, the third piece of advice I would give you, which is before you do anything, you have to pay due diligence. And due diligence in Memdec works means buying at least, excuse me, uh, four books, three or four okay. books. One is Bound to Please, so you get Simon's mm -hmm. input on it. Uh, Mnemonica, so you get Juan's input on it. I also suggest uh, Woody Aragon's Memorandum mm -hmm. uh, book. And uh, you got to read those all the way through. And you have to understand what effects are possible and what you want to do with a mem deck. Uh, only then can you begin to decide what stack will possibly be valuable for you. Right. So it's, it's, it's a lot of, if you take, there we go, well, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of time. Yes, but you don't want to memorize a stack and begin to get it under your fingers and in your brain and then realize it doesn't do what you want it to do. Mm -hmm. And then try to learn another one. That's a, a situation that just eats up so much of your life. It's really not useful. So the the due diligence part is is really important. Now, as far as memorizing it, um, a lot of it simply depends on how you respond to certain things. I mean, uh, Juan uses drawings and making up silly songs and what have you. Uh, the one thing I liked about doing it with mnemonics is... Uh, if you draw a blank when you're first working with the stack and somebody names a card and you can't remember where it is or somebody names a, uh, a number and you can't remember what card is there, with mnemonics you can actually reconstruct that information. Now, as I've said many times, it will look like you're having a stroke while you're doing that because <laughs> your, your speech will halt and uh, there will be a blank stare on your face, but you won't, you won't crash and burn. But, you know, right. if, if you're memorizing uh, the presidents of the United States and you don't remember who the 16th president was and you learned it by rote, nothing is going to help you reconstruct that information. So sure. uh, the one thing that surprised me very much about learning it with mnemonics is that uh, the mnemonics fell away. Um, yeah. Within a month, maybe maybe eight weeks, perhaps. That quickly. That quickly. And it's simply, I simply knew the card and the number. That's all that was there. And that's the way it is now. I, I have a hard time even remembering what uh, the mnemonics were. And the other, the other part of it, too, that is uh, really important, and what I had going for me was uh, you got to be in a position where you're going to use it often. And I was working at the restaurant called Illusions, and I was working five or six nights a week, uh, several hours every night. So once I started to put it into my repertoire, I really uh, pounded it home. I mean, it, I really uh, got it into my into my head. You know, the the good thing about a stack is that you can practice it uh, anywhere. You can practice it in the shower. Um, sure. uh, a key to it is don't recite it like you would recite the alphabet. Um, you know, if it, with uh, Aronson, you don't want to be going, let's see, uh, it's Jack of Spades and the King of Clubs, then the Five of Clubs and the Two of Hearts. It doesn't do you any good. What you want to do is say, well, where are the aces uh, in order from <sighs> top to, and where are the kings from bottom to top? And where, you know, uh, where are all the hearts? Where are all the clubs? You know, that idea, to mix yeah, it yeah. up. So that, um, and that, of course, is just the mental aspect of the stack. If you want to do... Uh, things like uh, riffing work, as I described in uh, The Road to Riffsville, um, then you have to start working on things like estimation and that sort of stuff. Um, but that is that's that is a very long, short answer uh, to your question. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Now, there's, uh, when I was researching this, there's a, there's a clip of you, I guess, from the 90s on oh, Channel 8. Yes. Where where the the host name the anchor names the six of clubs and it's channel eight and you count down to the eighth card and lo and behold it's the name card but the yep. kicker yep. is when he says he nearly picked the eight of diamonds and you switch it without going into method it doesn't really matter anyone knowledgeable will know what's going on but I've got one question yes sir how on earth did you not react and keep a straight face when he mentioned the next card oh well simply because. When you do a lot of mem deck stuff, that kind of thing happens with some degree of regularity. That you'll get lucky. That you'll get lucky, and that you simply um, uh, one good way when you're doing this, where you begin a trick without an expectation of how the trick is going to end, mm. then 
uh, you you have no reason to respond to anything because you're not going for anything. So uh. I learned uh, pretty early on that uh, you have to uh, completely conceal uh, any luck that happens. Now, you notice that even though the guy handed me the miracle, mm -hmm. I gave him the option to change his mind because yeah. that's an unwritten rule of memdeck work. When someone hands you a miracle, you have to be willing to give that miracle back by saying to him, do you want to change your mind? And of course, the beautiful thing about that is most people won't, and you can reinforce that fact later on as you, as you build up the trick. Um, an aspect of that show that uh, is relatively unknown is that the host, Dick Wolfsey, is someone I'd known for many, many years. In my career as a musician, I had uh, composed and performed uh, uh, the music for his talk show. He had a morning talk show. He was a very popular host uh, back in the 80s. So we knew each other uh, that way and then through the magic later on. So he had called mm -hmm. me up and said, listen, we haven't talked in a long time. Uh, come be on my show. He was at that point reduced to doing remote broadcasts from barnyards in Jasper, Indiana, out in the middle <laughs> of nowhere. Um, so we picked this hotel, uh, you know, uh, area to meet. And in the two weeks between the time he called me and the time I performed, uh, I found out every single thing I could about Dick Wolfsey. I found out birthdays. I found out the names of his kids. I found out where he got married. I found out... Um, what the name of his dog was when he was a child. And I prepared a bunch of effects utilizing that information, but not as the main part of the trick, but as a kicker that would show up at the end of the trick. So it was, and not only that, Dick, but this has this, you know, this kind of a thing. And as it turned out, none of them worked. None of them <laughs> hit. He went a different direction for every single one of these things I had planned. Because, you know, you can't research everything, nor can you... Sure prepare for every single out so i was really going into that last bit i was really disappointed that all these cool things i had planned for yeah. didn't work and then it turns around at the end and i get this uh two card miracle handed to me by the uh, by the guy i think it's the greatest trick ever performed on television maybe next to um uh a few things that have been on fool us that have been extraordinary so it, it is astonishing Astonishing. I'll put a link in the show notes if anybody hasn't seen it. But you mentioned Fullness. Let's let's go there. Okay. We've got lots of people listening to the show who would love to get on it. What sure. does it take to get on Fullness? Well, um, it's really pretty simple. Have have a good trick. Have a good <laughs> have a well. But there's there's some there's some caveats to that. There's some okay uh, things that go with that. You have to remember. Uh, Fool Us is a show that is, at its heart, uh, designed by magicians for magicians. And our goal on Fool Us is to showcase the performers who come on in the best possible light that we can. And I think we do that better than any other show on television, and possibly Couldn't better than any other show in the last 20 years. I mean, mm -hmm. um, because one thing you know about Fool Us is that we play fair. Because the nature of the game... Uh, fool us is that the performers are trying to fool Penn and Teller. There can't be camera tricks or editing tricks involved because mm -hmm. that destroys the nature of the game. But the fact that it is designed for magicians does not discount the fact that there are millions of non-magicians watching it. And those non-magicians have to be entertained by what you do. So... Sure. You should have a good trick. If I mean, your goal of coming on Fool Us should not be to try to fool Penn and Teller, because if that's your only goal, that tends to lead to convoluted tricks with uh, red herrings and all sorts of mm -hmm. other garbage thrown in. You should have a routine that is entertaining. Number one, right. something that uh, you know a layman would watch, and you know you've got up front, you have maybe. 35 or 40 seconds to hook somebody who's watching it. Um, as I explained, the difference between Fool Us and working a room like the Magic Castle is if the people in the Magic Castle close-up room are bored, there is no easy means of escape. Mm -hmm. Whereas on Fool Us, the means of escape is within a quarter inch of the finger that's on their remote. Sure. And, uh, oh, this guy's boring. Boop, gone. Mm -hmm. So you have to engage. You have to give me some presentation 
that hooks me and makes me interested in watching it. Uh, the effect should be clean. The effect should be, you know, I've, I've changed my, sort of my a perception of what a magician's job is. Uh, I don't, you know, we can use storytelling as a presentational factor, but I don't think magicians are storytellers. I think our job as magicians is to turn our spectators into storytellers. Nah. And for them to leave the performance having this astonishing experience to relate to their friends. And the best way to have a story that can be easily related is to have a clear cut effect where the process is understandable and seems to be unambiguous. Right. And so that's what you're looking for, for Fool Us. And, um, so it's going I'll, back to Vernon with an emotional hook and a trick that can be simply described, right? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. It, that's absolutely, and that's the nature of really great magic. I mean, look at the guys who have been on Fool Us who have really hooked you and who get a lot of commentary. Um, you know, uh, Boris Wilde is a fine example. His his uh, appearance on the what we're calling season seven A, which is the okay. one that we shot just before COVID kicked in, and which aired this summer. Um, his trick would have been, as presented by most magicians, his trick would have been a rather dry, procedural. How did he find my card? How did he get uh -huh. into that number? But the hook that he had of having uh, Adam Chire do a deep fake voice of pen was really brilliant and now you've got an interesting presentation and an interesting hook and it takes what would otherwise possibly be a pedestrian trick and turns it into something really entertaining uh for the people at home interesting um what what are some of the the common mistakes that people make when sending in audition tapes to you well uh it doesn't happen quite as much but it used to be that people would send in a pitch and say, here's what I'd like to do on the show. Well, we don't really have time for that. I mean, right. if you're going to send something in, it should be something that you've actually performed quite a bit. I mean, even though, we're, of course, we're in a situation right now where getting a performance under your belt in front of anybody is, is an extremely mm -hmm. difficult thing. And not just for the, you know, the acts that want to be on the show. It's difficult for Penn and Teller. Um, normally, you know, when... Uh, for every season of Fool Us, they have 13 new routines that they have to uh, perform. Sure. And most of the time, those things go into their live show, so they get flight time with it. Um, so you, you don't want to pitch. You want something that you've actually worked out. When you mm -hmm. send in uh, your performance, it's always nice if you can have people, if your trick requires somebody to perform for, if you can have people there to react. Um, I always like it when guys uh, care enough to uh, dress up a little bit. Uh, okay. Think about the fact that your submission video is your job interview. And think right. about how you go to your job interview, and that will give you some idea. I just I think it's kind of a respect thing. Maybe I'm old-fashioned that way. But I always think it's kind of nice if a guy looks presentable and, and does what he does. But that's just, that's just old man talking, so don't, don't, <laughs> take, don't take that. Uh, with too much, take that with a grain of salt. Um, and then it's simply, you know, to have a, I think those are the, that's the, probably the biggest mistake is just okay. not having a routine that has been, you know, uh, thought out with a presentation that's been thought out. Fair, fair. Um, you, you, you get involved quite a lot with the pre-production and helping the acts get TV ready, I guess. So how do you take an existing close-up trick routine and tweak it to make it work better for TV? Well, there are, um, uh, well, how, should I, how can I explain this briefly? Um, my job, and I've already started working on season eight, by the way, um, mm -hmm. which is not going to be recorded until maybe April or May, I think. Um, and we don't know exactly what the situation will be, how that will be, done because it's all going to depend on what yeah. the what the covid situation is and and uh, tragically uh in the united states the covid situation is uh out of control yeah. but <clears throat> what happens is the uh producers will send me videos that they find interesting and then i write an analysis of okay. uh, of the act and that includes many things but one aspect of what i write is if 
technically, uh, you know, from the technical magic side, if there are things that I think are not as polished, I'll use the word, even though that's not the best word, things that I can help uh, smooth out any rough edges. You mean and magical techniques? Exactly, exactly. Right, okay. You know, um, one of the things that TV does, it destroys all misdirection. Mm -hmm. um, the minute we draw this little box around the action, uh, everything I've learned over, um, uh, you know, 60, what did I say? Um, 61 right. years, 62 years, goes out the window. Because if I'm standing at a table, all I need to do is direct my attention from this person to this person, and everybody goes from my eyes to their eyes, and I can mm -hmm. do whatever I need to do in the darkness yeah. that, that that provides. But on a TV screen, everything is equally important. So that kind of misdirection simply doesn't work. And I've and we've had some routines that I've tried to work with guys on where it, it simply failed. It sort of never reached the point of this is going to make it to air because there were certain technical aspects of it that simply don't work convincingly on television. Um, sure. Now, it's not just the close-up guys who suffer from this because the Penn and Teller stage is huge. So if you have an act that requires that you secretly get something off stage or something gets brought on and it's supposed to be an unobtrusive and an unimportant action, by the time that person doing that has walked 25 feet to the middle of the stage, it's not a hidden action anymore. It's impossible to, uh, uh, to uh, cover. So uh, these are the kinds of things I look at. And then I spend a lot of hours on Skype or on Zoom uh, working with guys on, tech, on these aspects and, and trying to get them worked out. And the, the great thing about doing it this way is it, in the first few seasons, which I call the chaotic years, <laughs> um, much of this was a, we attempted to work out in Las Vegas when the act showed up there had their rehearsal in what we call the Belize Room, which is a meeting room that's just off the hallway that leads to the Penn & Teller Theater. And you can't change technical things that late in the game. Right. Because once you walk on the stage, especially in the day when we had you know 750 people in the audience, once you walk on that stage and see Penn & Teller and realize where you are, muscle memory takes over. And I don't care what you've learned in the last 24 or 48 hours, you're not going to remember it when you walk on stage. And this doesn't just happen to, uh, you know, uh, less uh, professional performers, I mean, or those with less experience. It happens to uh, professionals as well. They just, it, the pressure is too much. So by doing it on Zoom and doing it months ahead of time, we get a far more polished performance from from everybody so it's sure. it's really a i'm very comfortable working excuse me on zoom now it's uh, or skype or whatever the format uh because we can cover a lot of things we can cover quickly and then you know i go to do something else and they go away to practice and then you know maybe a day or two later they contact me again and we have another session and we see but it's a, it's a lot of hours on my part uh yeah getting everybody um, to as uh, polished a level as I possibly can. Because, you know, that's all I'm interested in. I am interested in having everyone who appears on Fool Us be as spectacular as they can possibly be. That's all I, that's my, that's my only goal. So and I think that's very, very clear when, I think it's very, very clear when people are watching the show. Um, th there's been a lot of uh, chatter online about Garrett and the ring trick. And yep. we even recently had a question, because on the Vanishing Inc. website, on the product pages, people can post questions. And just a few days ago, somebody posted a question saying, he said it wasn't a gimmick on Fool Us, so why is there a gimmick included? Can you share the real story about what happened with that? Uh, yeah, but I'll tell you what I can do that may be more... Um, and I can find this link for you and email it to you. Um, there was a particular YouTube... Uh, channel that was really trashing uh, Garrett big time mm -hmm. over this some this assumption that somehow he lied in the uh, when Penn asked him the question about the ring and I will send you that link because Matt Donnelly who is the writer for the show mm -hmm. um, 
has his own podcast, and uh, he and I talked about it, and we decided it would be, this is something that really needs to be thoroughly explained, so we had a conversation, uh, Matt and Garrett and I had a conversation about this very, very subject, and I believe cleared it all up. Okay. Um, the, the bottom line that I can tell you is, if Garrett had lied about the question, and it was a very specific question, and this is the important thing to understand, it's a very specific question, if he had lied in the response to that, you would never have seen it on TV. Nah. Because everybody in the booth would go, what the hell is he doing? Mm -hmm. And we would have stopped and reshot the thing because it's just not the way the thing works. Um, I'll try to explain this as briefly as I can. The, the most nebulous part of Fool Us is that part where Penn and Teller try to convey to the magician how the trick works. Yes. Um, because there is no magic book that I can go back to to find out things that will help us in Fool Us, we carve that jungle every year. We mm -hmm. hack out, oh, this, this, is, this path seems to be promising. Let's, let's move this way. Um, there was too much chaos and too much fog of war in the first few seasons as far as this part of the show was concerned. And now we have worked out a procedure that is completely fair, and I want to emphasize this, completely fair to all parties involved. The basic scenario is this. After the performer does his thing, and while he's talking to Allison, by the way, on TV, that interview is 45 seconds or a minute. In real life, it can be up to 10 minutes long. Okay. So that's hev that, that thing is heavily edited. We do edit for time. We don't edit for deception. Mm -hmm. And at, this, at that point in time, Penn and Teller are talking about how they think the trick worked. Uh, Andrew Golder, one of the executive producers, and I are listening to them discuss, and we say nothing. We say nothing until they come to a conclusion. Okay. And once they come to a conclusion, a couple things will have happened. One is they will have gotten it right. Mm -hmm. They will have gotten it completely wrong. Or there may be an aspect of it that they didn't get that I think they should know about because it's a really ingenious thing. Sure. So uh, if it's completely, if, you know, if they've got it, then all we have to do is craft language so Penn can convey that to mm -hmm. the contestant. Now, here's an interesting thing you don't know. I work on that language when I first see the audition video of the act. Because in my right. notes, I am making notes about what we can say on the bus. Because there's no time to be that clever uh, while, the, while the money is ticking away and the cameras are rolling. So yeah, I yeah, do yeah. that way early. And as a matter of fact, uh, this year, uh, for the second half of the season, the one done under COVID, uh, every morning I would send Andrew Golder uh, a word doc with all the information about what the act did, uh, what the phases are, and what we could say about it. So he had those notes in front of him, and I had them here in Canada, and we could get this all sorted out that way. So the decision of whether or not Penn and Teller were fooled does not happen while they're talking to the act. It's uh -huh. already decided before they open their mouths. And it's decided because they were either right or wrong. Yeah, 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 sure. And particularly in Garrett's case, they had no idea that a second prop was involved. Right. The only thing they thought was that he had a ring that in some way came apart but was mm -hmm. so brilliantly manufactured that you could examine it and not figure out how it came apart. Right. That was their conclusion. So, now you think, well, how do you make that into interesting television? And the way you make it into interesting television is to ask a question that Garrett can reply no to. Mm-hmm. Because then Penn says, we think that that ring is so f fantastically, you know, uh, manufactured that even Teller couldn't figure out how it comes apart. Is Do you have a gimmick ring like that? And the answer is, no, I don't. Yeah. Boom. It's done. And it, yeah, was, yeah, yeah. it was done before Teller and Penn even started to talk to him. And that's what the people don't understand about how Fool sure. Us works. Yeah, now, yeah, yeah. 
Were there crazy things that happened in the early years? Oh, you betcha. People come <laughs> up to me and say, well, how long did this guy do this? And how did this guy do that? And I say, this sh happens. I can't, <laughs> I can't talk about it. I can't talk about it. But rather than focusing on that, which is really not the point, you know, I just want people to be happy with the fact that Magic is getting such an, a fine showcase. And we do try to make it, you know, really interesting. I will tell you about the season that we just taped, the one we did under COVID protocol. Uh -huh. There were at least six things that I had never seen before. Really? Things that people had come up with and I went, wow, holy smoke, that's that's really great. Yeah, it's going to be... it's. It's going to be a really fun season. It's not the Fool Us we know and love, but mm -hmm. it's a really good season of Fool Us.